Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Kat Walsh, Chair of the Board of the Wikimedia Foundation. Dedicated to a world where every person freely shares in all knowledge, the Wikimedia Foundation hosts Wikipedia and other free knowledge projects that together form a top five web property and is used by half a billion people monthly. Currently, Wikipedia has more than 20 million volunteer contributed articles in 286 languages. A seasoned Wikipedian herself with over 11,000 edits and 70 article creations, Kat has been a Wikimedia board member since 2006. She currently serves as legal counsel at Creative Commons and has a background in free culture, free software, and free expression. Kat has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Kat, for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Mark. So, it is so interesting that you have spent so much of your time and career uh, driving free software, free knowledge, free expression, uh, an agenda um, that, that, that really is about free and, and open uh, communication access for all. Talk about how you got involved in this idea of free knowledge. So it was almost by accident. Uh, I was going to college to be a classical musician, which is obviously a field that's very booming. There's a lot of job opportunities there. So <laughs> uh, when I was just graduating from college and really starting to try and launch my career as an orchestral musician, uh, I had a lot of time on my hands. So one of the things that I did was volunteering for Wikipedia. I'd found the site while I was in college, and one of the things that really appealed to me is I'd done all this work in college. I'd done a lot of research papers, and I'd spend a lot of time and effort on it. And at the end of the day, uh, I'd have these things, and nobody would ever see it again. They'd get thrown in the trash. No use would ever be made of it. So when I found this site, I started to realize that all this work I had done could be put to some use. So I made some of these research papers into articles, and it was really powerful to see that people were reading them, people were commenting on them, that this was really actually doing something useful. So while I was doing this, I started getting further involved in the foundation. I started helping behind the scenes, answering some of the mail, helping people with legal so research. So you were just volunteering. You were taking not only your intellect, your work, your passion as an orchestral musician and, and as a scholar, but a scholar that, that did not have tenure, uh, did, w was not recognized as such, but, but still somebody who had spent a lot of time on a topic you were making it freely available, and then you just continue to volunteer. Part of what was really satisfying for me is that it was really about the quality of my work, what I was doing, and how useful it was for people, and not about how long I had been around or what credentials there were. It was just that I was doing good work, and that was recognized for itself. And that there were people all around the world who have expertise in different fields that isn't getting recognized, isn't getting put to use, and all of a sudden it is useful for people, and that's really capturing something that hasn't been captured before. Were you ever challenged uh, by people with a different point of view or with different credentials uh, in e either the facts that you were uh, revealing or uh, in the perspective that you were taking in your articles? The articles that I started out editing were mostly about classical music and classical composers, which is one of the least contentious areas on the encyclopedia. So a lot of the things that people generally find contentious didn't come up. Uh, a lot of it was really collaborative, and uh, that was actually really great for me. One of the first people that I started working together with was used to be a professor of musicology and had moved on to different fields, and he had found my articles, and he would suggest new articles to me or suggest new sources that I should find, and we would end up working together. A few things would get challenged. People would ask, where did you find that fact? And I would come up with a citation. But it was pretty collegial and uh, in a way that I hadn't been able to experience before. And it was, it, it's been a cons pretty considerable growth because uh, Wiki Wikipedia was actually established not too long ago. So Wikipedia was founded in 2001, it intended to be an offshoot to a site, Newpedia, that was intended to be basically not very different from the traditional model of an encyclopedia. They were going to have recognized scholars in a lengthy editorial process, and it was going to be free and online, but otherwise a lot of the same bureaucratic processes that traditional encyclopedias had, this project was also going to have with, with m many fewer resources. Uh, so they had a noble ambition, but at the end of their project they had about 20 articles. But they had this little offshoot to say, let, let's see what happens if we let the public make suggestions. You know, people who aren't scholars, let's just see if they can help us in this process. So people like you. People like me, people all over the place from all different backgrounds. 
And it turned out that that site was wildly successful. It began to take off and really producing useful things far faster than the other process was, uh, was producing anything useful. Eventually, the old site, Newpedia, was abandoned, and Wikipedia, its, uh, its experimental offshoot, was the thing that really took off. And fast forward just two years later, two years later, 24 months later, mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's in St. Petersburg, Florida, mm -hmm. uh, basically. It's got two full-time staff, a budget of $79,000, and people are accessing this site from all over the world and contributing to this site from all over the world. Between 2004 and 2006, what a dramatic uh, expansion. I think so. 2004, I think, was when it really started to hit the mainstream, and it was really starting to come up, come up in searches. and. That's where I found it. It came up in just a search for me. I was searching about the Contra Bassoon, and Wikipedia came up, and uh, I got sucked into the site. Uh, there was a lot of opportunities for new things to get started, and a lot of opportunities for volunteers to get involved. So in 2005 or so, people were asking, hey, we're having trouble answering all the email that people are, are asking us. We need volunteers to help. So of course, I'm, I'm underemployed, and I really love the site and what it's doing, so I say, I'll help answer the mail. And through doing that, I got to see the wide range of questions that people were asking, things people needed help with, and I started doing research on how to answer these questions, who should we talk to, who should we contact, and it really got me interested in the leadership and direction of the site, and that's how I got involved in the, that's how I got involved in the board a few months later. Uh, I decided to run. And, and, and what's very interesting is that you are, through, by following your passions, you're developing a certain qualification you're developing knowledge um, on how the community operates, on how the site actually functions. You're developing a, a set of opinions on improvements. Mm -hmm. You're networking with people, and you're building this, and, it, and it's all coming in from the grassroots. It's all coming in from, from your passions and then the interactions that you have in a way that, that has never been afforded in human history. I think that's right, and one of the most interesting things about the project is that there's not really just one community. Uh, the, the people who work on this project are many different communities. Uh, there are people who care about their subject area, who are intense hobbyists in music or in history or in uh, arts sciences. There are people who care about language preservation, so we have projects in over 200 languages, and some people who really want to make sure that there's an existing body of, lang of work in their language, that people in their language have something to, uh, to use. They're working, and that's their passion. Uh, there are people who are, te who are teachers who just love teaching, explaining things. Uh, there are people who just feel good, uh, feel good correcting typos and spelling errors. There are people who like to develop technical tools, and all these communities come together to work on this project. So describe how the board actually functions at, at, uh, at Wikimedia. It seems like it functions very differently from many other boards, um, and, and possibly because of the nature of the community itself. So I think that that's right. Uh, one of the major differences between our board and other boards is that we don't have to deal with fundraising at all, which is a, a great luxury for any nonprofit. Uh, ha having a top five website that just you ask people for money, say, hey, we're doing a great thing, could you please kick in five or ten bucks, and people do, is a, is a great luxury. We don't have to worry about that. And it doesn't have to compromise the other discussions that we have. Uh, as a board, our discussions can really be about strategy and what we're trying to do and not worrying about resource constraints. It's really about what is our mission and what can we do that will best help fulfill it. So well, we're not a fundraising board and we're not a working board, but we are very engaged in the strategy and the principles of the movement. A lot of our discussions are, for example, if we're trying to be decentralized and trying to let volunteers who are building the projects actually have some ownership of it, how does that, uh, what does that mean for the way we distribute funding? Uh, it means when we're trying to develop these tools, uh, if it's going to have an impact on volunteer participation, what kind of tools should we uh, be investing our resources in? That's the kind of conversations that we have. And, uh, a lot of the people, there are people from within the movement, there are people we've appointed from outside the movement who have come in and become part of us, and together we bring our perspectives to these questions. And it's been a really rewarding experience on the board, and we advise the executive on how best to implement that and how best to do it with the participation of our community. So conventional qualifications for such a board would, would run um, 
along certain familiar lines, uh, whether somebody can write a large check mm -hmm. or influence large checks being written, mm -hmm. um, whether somebody has a certain set of qualifications or affiliations with major universities or, um, or, or with, with certain uh, corporations or maybe journalism mm -hmm. organizations. How do your criterion run for board membership? So we have three different sets of board members, all of which have different criteria, and none of them involve writing large checks, which is really unusual for a board. Uh, aside from the three sets, there's Jimmy Wales, who has a seat as founder and has that seat for as long as he wants it. Uh, I'm one of the community elected members, and there are three of us, and we're chosen by the community every two years. And a lot of that is because a lot of what's important for guiding the strategy and direction of the movement is having experience within it, trying to work within it, trying to, to have built it. And that's important if we say we're a community-owned project, and the community really does own the projects. They built it, they made it happen. Shouldn't there be represent representation in its leadership? So I'm one of those members. Uh, I happen to be an attorney, which is very useful uh, on the board, having to deal with governance issues and policy issues. Uh, We've had people who are librarians, who are scientists, who are engineers, all, all kinds of different backgrounds. And the thing that we have in common is uh, we have a lot of passion for the projects and experience in it. And generally, our peers have recognized us as being very thoughtful and uh, interested in the direction of the projects. They and, trust us to keep the principles. And are there, are there political parties <laughs> within uh, Wikimedia? Do, are there billions of dollars spent on, <laughs> on getting elected? And it's actually kind of shocking how little electioneering there is. There, there's almost, you almost don't know that people are running for the board unless you read their very, you know, kind of dry and very high-minded political, uh, you know, high-minded high position statements. Uh, they're, not, they're not very political. You don't see people advertising that they're running. It's just... So it's values-based? It's and, very values-based. Uh, it's th this is what I do. This is my experience on the projects. This is what I think I will bring to the board. Please vote for me. And a lot of people will have experience in their local chapters or on particular outreach projects, and people know their reputations through those things and decide which qualities would be best suited to leadership. And if somebody has a reputation for being um, not accurate, for not caring mm -hmm. about, about facts that mm -hmm. are embedded in these, these uh, articles, or if, if they have a reputation for being unpleasant or mm -hmm. not having... Um, uh, values <laughs> that strengthen the community, um, that sort of tanks their, their uh, yeah. so it's very reputational. It's very it's much very about how you interact with other people and what you actually are contributing. It really is, and there's probably no bigger black mark you can have in the Wikimedia movement than not caring about accuracy, not caring about getting things right. So, of course, if you had that kind of reputation, it would instantly tank your candidacy. And process is also important, that you listen to other mm -hmm. people, even people with radically opposed uh, viewpoints. There's none of this, it seems, um, of trying to knock down somebody with a different viewpoint uh, based on anything other than factual presentation <laughs> or, or values. Yeah, I think that's right. Our processes are just so much more deliberative. And if you keep trying to push, uh, push things that aren't based in fact that you can't back up, somebody else is going to come along and say, that's not based in fact. Here is what the real story is. You just can't get away with it for very long just because of the way our processes work. Let's go back to the, to the composition of the board. Sure. So there are two seats who are f selected by our chapters. Uh, we have about 40 chapters all over the world, and we're starting to expand beyond geography-based chapters into things like uh, organizations based around common languages or common interests. We have a group of doctors and a group of Esperanto speakers, uh, people like that. But part of the reason that they select seats is because sometimes people who are really make valuable contributions and would be a great addition to the board have been working with these organizations, but aren't necessarily as widely known to the community that they would be elected in a community election. Mm -hmm. A lot of the things that I did were very visible to the community. I did a lot of dispute resolution that got seen by, uh, widely by the community and participated on mailing lists, things like that. But a lot of people are doing, say, outreach work with their local chapters that wouldn't necessarily be recognized by a wide enough swath of the community that they'd be elected. So uh, the people who are involved in those organizations, the chapters, uh, they get to select two seats based on people who have done good work uh, that they recognize. Uh, the other four seats are appointed. Uh, they're appointed by the board. And we look for a skills, expertise, perspectives that are missing from the board and try to appoint somebody to fill them. 
We look for areas of expertise from people who share a lot of our values. They have to be committed to freedom of expression. They have to be committed to free knowledge. They have to really get what it is that we're trying to do with the community ownership. Uh, but they have these other outside uh, perspectives and outside expertise. So you have, you have a constant refreshing mm -hmm. of the board. They're, they're off cycle, so not everybody leaves at the same time. Um, you have these different modalities to ensure different constituencies get um, represented and that your technical expertise is also balanced on the board. It seems like a, a very, um, very um, contained structure, and there are only 10 board members. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of the next several years, you're now at a, at a real transition mm -hmm. point for the organization with your executive director mm -hmm. who has stewarded you through this tremendous expansion, mm -hmm. uh, deciding to step uh, away mm -hmm. from that position. And uh, you are now recruiting a, a new uh, executive director. Talk about the challenges that you face at, at this moment in time. That's right. Uh, so we've had a great five years, almost six years, with our previous executive director. And she came in, the foundation was still a very new thing. We'd had a few short-term executive directors, but really they were, they were managing a very small budget and a very small staff. And most of what happened on the projects was just happening organically with volunteers, the same as it always had. And Sue Gardner came from the CBC. Um, right. She had come from a journalistic background. Mm -hmm. She came from a journalistic background, but also from the website of a journalism company. So she had experience with, the, with doing things on the web and also with the journalism where information came from. And also just had a really strong sense of community and of free expression and the same values that we held. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of surprising that she hadn't been an active participant on the, on the projects beforehand because she just had that same uh, worldview, the same way of thinking about things. And she brought with it uh, that managerial experience and the experience running a web company and was able to take us from a kind of ragtag group of volunteers into a really professional organization. So it's taken about five years to come from this ragtag group that where volunteers were doing the accounting and sometimes it didn't get done and sometimes nobody knew who was the press contact into this thing with like 150 employees. Really almost everything has changed about the formal organization. It, it used to be entirely volunteer driven. Uh, now we're thinking that a lot of the resource of, resources of the organization are best spent trying to influence that a little bit. Uh, there are a lot of things that can only happen if there's a real centralized push to make them happen. For example, helping the technical infrastructure develop. Uh, if we're going to be on mobile, we really need somebody with expertise in mobile who can spend a full-time job's worth of time on mobile and many full-time jobs worth of time on mobile. And to ask that of volunteers, volunteers are integral to the development of these things, but you can't ask volunteers to, to do focused effort uh, on these kind of things and expect them to stay there, expect them to do all the boring work and the grunt work. And the damage of not having that professional staff is that eventually these capabilities are overtaken by different interests that, that are more interested in monetizing uh, attention and, and, and eyes um, as opposed to building community and providing free knowledge for everyone um, regardless of, of means and regardless of where they are in the world. Yeah, I think that's right. So a lot of the reason the uh, writing of the projects themselves, the writing of the articles is, be is easy to do with volunteers and is best done by volunteers is that doesn't need to be as focused and efficient. If it's not perfect now, somebody will come along step by step and eventually make it perfect. Uh, it's not as timely as developing for particular platforms. Whereas if you miss the boat on mobile, somebody will develop something competing on mobile and all of a sudden everybody on their phones will be using this thing. And your thing, which had so much potential and has so much about it that is so much better than everything out there, it, it'll get missed and people won't be use it. So. Uh, if we're not having people do that, how can we fulfill our mission? How can we make sure that these things that are really great about our project are spread out into the world? Well, let alone the fact that the hardware and, and operating system development cycle shift. So mm -hmm. you had um, uh, iOS uh, 4, iOS uh, 5, iOS 6, and so on. And, and now they're talking about releasing, uh, releasing 7. If you don't get your projects done mm -hmm. and a product out there, by the time the next shift happens, then, then you can just throw away the, the whole effort, whether it's volunteer or, or non-volunteer effort. Uh, you can just end up doing a lot of work but never having any result. Basically, 
Yeah, an article is useful whether it's a paragraph or, or you know, ten paragraphs or uh, several pages. Uh, it's still useful, and, and if you get something that's most of the way there, you haven't completely missed the boat. Whereas if you have something that just doesn't work on a platform, you've missed it entirely. Nobody can use it. So uh, that kind of gradual development works well for some things, but it works less well for others, such as the technical infrastructure. What is, what is the next ten years for Wikimedia hold? What are your major challenges? Some of the challenges over the next 10 years are largely in reaching populations that we haven't reached yet. Uh, the biggest demographic who participates on our site, uh, building it and reading it, more building it, is young, overeducated white males in wealthy countries, uh, which is great because they have a lot of capacity to do a lot of things, but there are, there's a lot of knowledge that doesn't get reflected when certain populations have that knowledge and uh, they're not able to write about it or read about it. Uh, so there's a lot of things that are mostly known by women or mostly known by people in less wealthy countries that just isn't really well covered because the people who know about it aren't able to write about it. Or they, either they aren't able or they aren't interested and we're trying to figure out why and how can we be more accessible socially, technically, how can we bring those people in to be participating in not only reading the world's knowledge but also creating it. Uh, if we're going to reflect the knowledge of the world we really need to bring everybody in. So part of it is studying some of the social dynamics of the site. Why is it that some people participate and not others? Some of it is building technical tools. Uh, for the past 10 years, a lot of what we've been able to do is just let the site grow organically. Uh, do, do what people were interested in, uh, hit, hit all the low-hanging fruit. Everything that is easy has been done. Now we're trying to really figure out the more difficult interventions that may require more technical development, more study, more really focused effort to figure out why those people aren't there and how do we bring them in. And if everybody has a mobile device, but the mobile device doesn't have a big screen and a keyboard, how do you capture that, the, the knowledge that people want to contribute in that way? So you're also developing a whole uh, suite of new products mm -hmm. and capabilities. Uh, name a couple of those products and, and capabilities that are, that are receiving some concentrated effort at this point. Well, I think one of the most interesting thing that's happening is the Wikipedia Zero project. And what that is is partnering with mobile providers in other parts of the world and uh, letting them offer Wikipedia for free, uh, no data charges for people who are accessing Wikipedia through those networks. And, Part of it is just good advertising, part of it helps get people on those networks, but it really can be a great resource for people who are, who could have access to knowledge if only they could pay for it. And then now we're saying like, you don't need to pay for it, this is a public resource. We're not charging, your mobile provider isn't charging, you can have this knowledge free. And if it, uh, it gets people to use Wikipedia, it gets people to use the other mobile networks. Uh, uh, we're hoping that can have a big impact. It's really hard to, to get people to know about it. Awareness is probably the biggest problem, but uh, we've expanded into many different countries now, and it has a, a real potential to be a great resource. And for people in the global south, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, they're not stringing cables, um, mm -hmm. they're, they're doing their communications through cellular networks, um, and uh, very often that cellular network, that mobile phone, that mobile device, is the sole mm -hmm. way that people access the internet. Uh, that is tremendously important. It will, it will actually shift uh, whole usage patterns, uh, particularly because mobile devices need to have software that is very, very easy mm -hmm. to use. You don't have that much uh, luxury to make things too complicated. That's right, and it's been a big challenge because a lot of the model of Wikipedia in the past has been somebody sitting at their desktop able to type 10 paragraphs, and nobody's going to do that on their phone. You'd have to be incredibly dedicated and a little bit insane to do that on your phone. So what are the ways that people can really add value and add content through their mobile device? So one thing that we've done is made it really easy for people to take pictures of things and add pictures. And that's uh, really great to have widely distributed because you just can't sit at your computer and take pictures if you're not in certain places. You have to be there to be able to get the photos of them. So that's been made a lot easier and that's been a really interesting development. Uh, how can we make it easier now for people to just check facts, correct spelling, all the little tasks that really need to be done that are, that are hard to do right now? Uh, but can be done by people with 10 minutes on their phone while they're waiting for the bus, you know, while they're in the doctor's office, things like that. Uh, if we can make that easier, that'll be a huge improvement. And all in a way that is free? All in a way that is free. Open to everyone. Mm -hmm. It does not monetize your attention. Um, it is just uh, a public service. Uh, Kat Walsh, thank you so much. Our thanks to the entire 
uh, Wikipedia, Wikimedia community for the work that you do that benefits us all. And thank you for your insights. Well, thank you for having me here, Mark. It was great chatting with you.